Looking forward to this. Exciting here. Just love love the other book, and we want to welcome back uh, Tony Agnesi. Uh, Tony, good morning, sir, uh, with, with your second book here. Thank you, Tom. Yeah, I, I, it's almost like uh, babies, you know, every nine months. Uh, <laughs> yeah. have another book. But another one. <laughs> uh, this book, yeah, this book is, is different than the first book. The first book was a personal thing, and it talked about family and holidays and, and, and where we get our grace, how that grace comes to us through some of the things we do, like celebrating Christmas or whatever. And and the graces that come to us. This book is a little different. It's about service. And uh, the subtitle of the book is called Turning Your Misery into Ministry. And people hear that and they say, I don't get that. Well, when you have parents of an autistic child, you'll find them raising money for autism. Uh, The guy giving um, a homeless man a pair of boots on the bridge was once homeless himself. Uh, The couple that bring food to a needy family at the holidays had someone do that to them years ago and they're and they're paying that forward the woman visiting a cancer patient at the hospital is a cancer survivor and so what the lord does you know where was god in all of this is what's said when tragedy happens and the truth of the matter is we all have hard times all of us have hard time if we haven't had them (laughs) you're gonna it's coming it's coming so we all have have had hard times and god doesn't prevent hard times but he does promise us in Corinthians 10, 13 to get us through those hard times. So um, once we're through hard times, oftentimes we are the best people to minister to others with the same same uh, uh, situation. Uh, some of the best drug counselors I know uh, are recovering drug addicts because they've been, been there, done that. And it's the same thing with the homeless ministries I work with. I work with a lot of people in the homeless ministries who have once been homeless. and. So they know what it's like, you know. They've been there and done that. So they bring a different, uh, a different uh, view to it. So that's what this book is uh, is about: a storyteller's guide to joyful service. Um, there are sixty-eight uh, stories in this book, uh, very similarly formatted to the first. Each story is uh, attached to a piece of scripture. Um, I really like to have stories and scripture go together. And then at the end of each story, I have a couple, three, four questions to reflect on. I've got a lot of uh, men's, a men's group here at Sacred Heart, the Methodist group here in town. They use the book as kind of a conversation starter. You know, you'll, you read a story and it kind of kicks things in. And I've sat in on a few of those men's groups. And what's really neat about it is not my stories as much as the stories that come out of it that each of the people tell. You know, if and, and to me, the reason I write the book is to kind of put myself out there and then you get into the story and you relate your own experiences and your own story. So the book um, uh, actually hard released on Monday of this week. Um, it, it's been out since uh, August 18th and we, we did a soft launch on it because I had a, a number of big speaking engagements and we wanted to have the book available for that. But it launched on Monday. And uh, a Monday night, I, I got a, uh, a notice that it was on the inspirational bestseller list at Amazon. It, it was like 63, and in the morning when I woke up, it was up to 38, and it's also on the on the spiritual growth uh, chart as well uh, with Amazon. I was telling Tina we compete with people like Max Lucado and Joyce Meyer, so it's wonderful to be in that in that kind of company. You know, and there's there's several stories in in in, in your book here, Tony, that uh, where you know a lot of people. You don't have to wait until your 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 crisis or whatever you're going through is over no. to start giving back. I mean, sometimes the best part of healing you do it while you're doing that. You know, um, I witnessed this, um, and again, it was you know you know a, a child, and and again, it's it was neat to see a a, a little kid do this. It was during the um, um, chop of the cop. And uh, you know they get their little gift cards and they're buying stuff, or whatever. And I'm and, and, I, and I'm there. It, it, it's a store, and we're going back out. And the one fireman's walking out with the little guy. He's ten years old, you know. And uh, and the the little guy didn't even spend everything on his card. And the fireman said, "Hey, you know, you've got six or eight, ten dollars what left on it. You know, take it home when you come back. Give this to your mom. You know, you can. Do you have your card? I have it. You know, you can still spend the money on it. It's not just good for you. Explain it to him how it worked. Mm-hmm. So they go back out to the car and they're putting his stuff in the trunk and I'm helping him putting them in. And he said, okay, okay, you're all ready. Where's your card? The little kid goes, I don't have it. And, and he's going, well, we walked 30 feet. What'd you do with your, you know, how did you lose it from? Mm-hmm. He said, I put it in the red kettle at the Salvation Army for some other little kid. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, he was just helped in there. Mm-hmm. And to see that 10-year-old all on his own 
Mm-hmm. give back when he was still in need i mean he didn't even have his stuff home yet for his family and he's giving back that's where you really see the connection on some of this yeah and i think all you have to do is be open to that there's a great story i think and i don't think it's in either of these books i think it may be in my next one but uh, there was a, a woman that was speaking at a banquet i went to this is a, a few years back and she told this story and it was her own personal story and she said that um Uh, When she was young, um, uh, her congregation at her church, the pastor said, we have a really needy family in the church, and we would really like to take up a collection for this needy family, and, and, you know, bring what you can next week, and we'll give it to this needy family. And she said she went back home, and and she felt terrible. I mean, she went through the cushions of the couch to find change and went through her piggy bank, and she she managed to come up with three or four dollars, which she uh, just didn't think was a whole lot of money, and wouldn't matter much. So the next Sunday, they're back in the church, and the pastor says, you know, please come forward and, and you know, bring your money that we're going to give to this needy family. And she went up with her 3 or $4, whatever she had, and she put it in the basket and, and so forth. And then the pastor called up the needy family. It was hers. It was her family. Oh. And so this woman is now an entrepreneur. She's, she's, she's philanthropic. She donates large, large sums of money to charities. But it all started by her as a young child, not realizing that it was her family that was the, the needy family and that she scrounged around to find, you know, a meager three or four dollars. It reminds me of the widow's mite in the Bible, right? The, the two coins that she put in was more than a lot of people who had lots of money and put in very little. And she put in what she had, which were just these two coins. That's how we judge our faith, by, by, by that. And so, Tom, you're absolutely right. You don't need to, to, to totally be through before you can, um, before you can minister. I, I know a, a couple of people who have, done, who have lost a spouse and have been there for other people who had spouses that were terminally ill or whatever. And, and a lot of times while they were going through it themselves, it's just somebody to commiserate with, you know, and so forth. That's what, that's what we're offered. That's the grace we're offered. And this book uh, begins the first, uh, you know, the first chapter begins with that little prayer. I think I shared it with you that I pray every morning. And it's, Lord, make me an instrument. Put somebody in front of me today that you can help through me. It's, it's what I call checking in for duty. You know, and uh, being open uh, to the bumps and nudges and so forth that that God gives us. And I'm not special in any way. Uh, Those nudges come to all of us. What I've discovered, though, is that for the most part, we don't act on them. I know I didn't. I know I would uh, something would happen, and I'd say, "Oh, I should go talk," and I don't. Why? And then maybe later you feel bad about it. I should have went and talked to that person, or I should have done something. And so when we open ourselves to that I, you know you put out our antenna and uh, um, bruce wilkinson in the book uh, you were born for this uh, talks about you know just kind of getting at the antenna and say lord you know put somebody in front of me and i find that when you when you say that little prayer I, I, uh, uh, tony de stefano in his book 10 prayers god always says yes to says don't pray unless you mean it because it's going to happen it's going to happen all the time, and it does. I, I, I can vouch for that, uh, that it happens all the time. And there's always somebody that's put in front of you on a daily basis that, that you can help. And, and it could be just a very small thing, or it could be a major thing, or somewhere in the middle, but uh, just to be open to that. I know, Tina, we were talking, and I, I, I was mentioning earlier that you uh, – uh, I did a beautiful piece on Facebook about a God nudge that you had and an appointment, God appointment that you had, and how you followed through on that. That was a, it was a really heartwarming uh, story because of what it involved. It was so great. Um, one of our best days this summer involved a neighbor's eight-year-old grandson, and my I have a five- and two-year-old. We were set to, um, so this is a Monday. My kids had to go to the pediatrician. They had to get their shots, and they the shots always kind of mess with my boys a little bit, so they were extremely tired. And we were walking around the block, and we have seen this neighbor before, but never her eight-year-old grandson. And he just wanted to play, and I thought, Oh boy, you know, well, we can play until they're really showing signs that they're just exhausted. So we did, we played for an hour at their house and this little boy was telling me this entire life story of his, but he was so, so sweet. And when we left, I said, you know, buddy, we'd love to play with you again. And he was like, well, can we play later or tomorrow? Because he lived farther away and he was going to start school. So 
I said, yeah, yeah, we will make it happen. Well, I could not get this little boy out of my head. And Tuesday, we were scheduled to um, host a pool party at my parents' house with some of our friends. And Gavin and I, my oldest, were talking, and I, I couldn't shake this boy. I couldn't shake him all day, all night, could not sleep over this. And we woke up in the morning, and we just decided we needed to love on this boy. There was a reason that we, he just needed to show love. We needed to show love to him. So I called my neighbor, uh, whose sitter was coming over, and we were like, let's go across the field. Let's do water balloons, play baseball. We have a playground across the field at the school. And simple, simple stuff. Well, this little boy had never played with water balloons and never played baseball before in his whole life. And to see these kids raging in age from, well, nine months old, the nine month old didn't, you know, play so much, but say two, my son, uh, to age 13, were the various kids there loving on this boy. My heart nearly exploded mm. just showing him how to play baseball. And he was just having the time of his life. And his grandma sent me a message later that day and said that he could not stop talking about how much fun he had had. Mm -hmm. And all because I said yes to a God appointment. I think sometimes the noise of this world clouds that quiet or that insistent, you know, like kind of knock. Um, knock at your emotions, if you will. And because I said yes, I, you know, or we said yes, it had this effect that you just wouldn't have thought something so simple but so special. There's a story in the book called But She Did. And, and it, it's a story of, of, of how people, uh, and I'm, I'm not sure a young boy, but most people don't ever forget those kindnesses. You know, uh, I can remember um, when I was in the hospital, uh, after my cancer surgery who came to visit me and I can remember one person came from a long distance to see me I'll never forget that why because he did you know uh, the funeral of, of somebody that we know is uh, that might be two hours away and we get in the car and drive two hours to be there that's remembered even though there were hundreds of people let's say at the funeral that's remembered because they did you know because they did that and oftentimes uh, you know i always say you want to be the person that they say when when it came up i did that and the only way to do that is to respond as you did and to and to uh, and to be there for people uh, you mentioned god appointments i, I have a couple of stories and I, here's the problem i have because i've been on with you guys a couple of times i forget what stories yeah. i've already told <laughs> Well, we're not going to stop. You won't yeah, stop. We, we, won't. we love hearing them, even <laughs> if we've heard them once, once before. before yeah. One of that, one of the groups I work with, and just to, to give a plug to uh, the Embrace Clinic and Care Center, which used to be the Community Pregnancy Center in Barberton, and I began working with them over 25 years ago by uh, delivering uh, uh, some, uh, yeah, milk, uh, milk, uh, yeah. delivering formula and diapers yeah, and so right. forth to them, and. Uh, uh, Many, many years, not many years after that, but my wife sat on their board for about 10 years. And one year she was running their Christmas room. And uh, what they do is they give uh, clothing and toys and so forth for unfortunate kids. And, and so um, I, my wife had read in the paper that the Pennies outlet at Rolling Acres Mall, which is now a, a, a nothing but a, a pile <laughs> of dirt, but the Pennies outlet, had a sale on kids' coats. And they were, I mean, very reasonably priced kids' coats. And I remembered it from my youth, my aunt. I had an aunt. Antoinette was her name, but we called her Aunt Jay. And she worked at the uh, dry cleaning and laundry in the heat for 90 cents an hour. And every year she would buy me and my sister and my three cousins, all five of us, brand new winter coats. And so I thought that was the coolest thing because her 90 cent an hour job, she had to stash a lot of dough to buy five winter coats. And so this was my opportunity to pay it forward. I had this nudge to pay it forward. And so I went to the Penny's outlet, Diane and I went together, and we loaded up a couple of shopping carts. The coats were really nice. We loaded up a couple of shopping carts with coats, and we're going to the checkouts, which were really long because of the sales. A girl opened a new checkout. We went to the new checkout. She was pregnant. She was crying. She asked what the coats were for. We told her that they were going to the pregnancy center. She had been kicked out of the house by her parents. Her boyfriend had abandoned her, and she was living in a little one room and with this part-time job. And so my wife was able to give her, you know, give her the address and a card and whatever. And we got her all the things she needed, a crib and a layout and car seat and all of those things for her baby and, and a coat for the kid and a coat for her as well. So um, 
that's a God appointment. Now, see, I thought the God appointment was for me to go to pay back my aunt. The real God appointment was to meet this girl and to be able to uh, direct her in a way that she could do this. We had a fundraiser last Saturday night for the Embrace Clinic and Care Center, this, this particular group in Barberton. 25 or 30 years ago, it was in a little house on Worcester Avenue. Now it's on First Street. It's a beautiful 5,000-square-foot single-story facility. And last year, they added free ultrasound. Any uh, uh, woman that, that wants an ultrasound, can't afford it, doesn't have the insurance to cover it, whatever, can go in and get a free ultrasound. And they provide all of these services, uh, car seats and, and layettes and formula and diapers and so forth, at no cost. Now, it's wonderful to see how that organization has, has grown over the years. I was fortunate and humbled to be able to do all of their strategic planning here the last 10 or 15 years and to try to help them uh, move the organization forward. Uh, the other uh, God appointment that I, I, and I probably, did I tell you about the, the woman at uh, St. Bernard's? The homeless woman? No. Oh, mm. hey. That one doesn't sound no. familiar. No, I don't think so. It's, it's, a story, it's a story called, Hey, You're in My Seat. Oh, yeah. and, well, uh, I remember you're, reading you're, it because it's yeah. in the uh, it's, it's in, in the first, yeah. first book, yeah. And so, and so I, I uh, you know, St. Bernard's is a big church. I think it seats over a thousand people, and so, uh, and I go there sometimes at twelve ten. It's like a noon. Uh, mass. I get in the car and I go down Exchange Street. Every light turns green as I drive. It's almost like the <laughs> yeah. Lord is parting the, the way. Parting the, the water. Yeah. yeah, and pull in and I go. And I walk in, I grab a hymnal and I walk in and there's somebody in my seat. Now there's a... Th- no, you'll be... Right. At noon on a Tuesday, there might be 30 people in the a church that seats a thousand, but she chose... <laughs> to be in my seat, which most people have their own seat, you yeah. know, where they sit. So I, I go in, and I'm kind of a little bit annoyed, and I get in the same row with her, and she nods over. I thought she was maybe a college uh, student who hadn't studied and was in there kind of getting in a, a last prayer lick before she had to take a, a final <laughs> Nothing else worked but, on this. Yeah, I'll yeah, go for a prayer, but it wasn't. And I could tell yeah, instantly that she uh, was was – homeless and oh, she was a little bit older she was probably in her uh, early 30s and so uh, uh church began mass began and i opened the hymnal i noticed she didn't have one so i kind of scooted down next to her and shared my uh hymnal with her and as um, mass progressed i could tell that this, she hadn't been in a church uh, or if she had it <laughs> it'd been a while and so when the mass ended uh i was getting up to leave and she stopped me and she said sir can i tell you a story and i said yes yeah. she said I have an appointment at the courthouse. I owe a $50 fine, and I don't have the money. All I had was enough money to get a bus down to the bus station, and I walked from the bus station going toward the courthouse, and I saw this church, and I thought I'd come in and pray for a miracle. So I came in and sat in this particular seat, and I said, oh, yeah, yeah, my seat, actually. (laughs) (laughs) My chair. (laughs) Uh, And she said, um, I was crying, and uh, you see that elderly woman down there? And I said, yes, I do. And she said, she came over and asked me why I was crying, and I told her, and she took out her checkbook and wrote me a check for $50. And she flashed the check in front of me, and all I can tell you is the woman's name began with Judge. Mm. So the person that had helped her was a retired uh, judge. And so I said, that's fantastic. That's a wonderful miracle that happened for you. And so I went to leave again, and, and she said, sir, uh, I haven't eaten in three days. Do you, you know, do you have any way to help me? And this was one of those days I didn't have, you know, any money with me. My wife, I had already blown through my $20 <laughs> allowance that, that my wife gave me that week. But I knew there was an ATM machine just over hill, the hill at the Akron U took over the old uh, Polsky's building, I think it was, or O'Neill's. Yep. I think it was Polsky's. Polsky's. And so I knew they had an ATM there. So I said, come, let's walk. So we walked down the hill together, and the ATM just happened to be my bank, and I got her enough money to get through a couple of days, and we had uh, had lunch, and, and she had to get to her appointment. So I walked her back up the hill toward the, uh, toward the courthouse, and as we got near, she had to cross the street. She gave me the biggest hug, and she said, I walked into that church for the first time. That's the first time I've ever been in a church, and I was praying for a miracle, and I got two two miracles and um, she hugged me and and headed to the courthouse and she turned and looked back and I said next time just don't sit in my seat and, uh, <laughs> and I went on but you see there was a God appointment there were two actually the judge had a God appointment I had a God appointment with this young woman now I've been back there a few times and she's been at church they so uh, I, I think 
you have to be open to these things. And uh, even though I was annoyed that here's someone in my seat, God put that person in my seat so that we could have that exchange. And because of that exchange, she was able to to uh, have a couple of wonderful things happen. Well, and, 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 you know, too, the, the other thing with that is a lot of people will say, you know, you, you want a miracle, but you don't believe in miracles. Uh, well, there you go. You know, I mean, yeah, and, and it, it, it's, it's, it's along the lines of, uh, I mean, it, it is a joke, but there's the uh, – you know, there's a, a car comes by and knocks on the guy's door and said, hey, the, you know, the, the, the waters are rising. The dam's in bad shape. We'll take you out of here. And the guy at the house says, no, he said, the, the Lord will take care of me. And so the guy moves on in the car. Of course, the flood waters rise, and they come <laughs> along in the boat. And the guy knocks on the door with a boat, and he said, hey, we'll take you out of here. No, 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 the Lord will take care of me. Okay. So the guy's on top of his roof, and, I mean, the waters are coming up, and they come in with a helicopter. Same thing. I'm not going. The Lord will take care of me. Well, the, the guy drowns. So he, he's at the pearly gates, and he said, Lord, he said, why would you let me drown? He goes, I sent you a car, a boat, and a helicopter. <laughs> he said, you, you know, he said, you, the, the, all three signs were there. I gave you three miracles, but you have to believe in them. You've got to believe in them in order to do it. That's a great, great story. The stories in here, you you mentioned the first book was maybe more personal Mm -hmm. stories than this. Where do you find, do you, do you, get stories from other people do people no. send them to you is it you know stuff that you just you know happenstance with no I, I i've been collecting stories from other people and and that'll be down the road I'll, i'm gonna do a, a few books of, right. uh, because some of those stories are just magnificent stories that somebody needs to write and and i'll do that no these are all yeah. uh things that have happened to me over the course of the ministries that i involve myself with so um you know when i talk about things when i talk about uh, the uh, the homeless it's because i'm working with them or if i talk about uh, my my uh, jail ministry i've been 14 years at the medina county jail and on tuesday nights we 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 minister to uh people there we have services we talk to the women we talk to uh, general population to the segregation group uh, you know the 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 more, more difficult crimes and so forth and and i've been doing that and and um I mean, we have a team from Wadsworth here that goes in. And so some of those stories come as a result of that. The, mm-hmm. the Pregnancy Center, you know, for example, uh, I, when I'm going to be speaking there um, at, uh, on the uh, week from now on the, uh, um, at uh, the Embrace Center. And I'm going to be speaking for a group called Steadfast Fathers. And basically what we discovered over the course of time at the pregnancy center was a lot of guys would pull up in their car and their girlfriend, pregnant girlfriend, would get out and go in. And they'd sit in the car and smoke a cigarette and uh, wait for her to come out. Well, what a missed opportunity. And so they formed a men's group, a men's ministry called First and Ten. And what they do is they will send a guy out there and get him and bring him in and set him at a high top table and give him a bag of chips and a Coke and talk about what it means to be a father. And uh, oftentimes we find that, uh, that uh, a lot of people, I, I know in, the, in a jail circumstances, almost 80% of the men and women in jail have no father or father figure, no male in their life, coach, uncle, guy down the street that they can point to that has, has fathered uh, them. And so fatherhood to me is an extremely important, uh, important thing and to be able to, to, uh, to work with them. So I've, they've invited me to come speak to this group. Steadfast Fathers then is a group of men uh, 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 who have come there to learn how to be better fathers. Some of them uh, are, are single with, uh, you know, with kids, uh, uh, you know, from, from pregnant girlfriends. Some are married. Some are grandfathers who are forced into being a father because maybe, maybe the parents are drug addicts and so grandma and grandpa are actually raising. But this group of men have come together with the understanding that, that they want to be better fathers. Now, there are some programs where the court orders people to, you know, your court order to go do a, a program. This isn't the case. These people are volunteers volunteering to be there and if they go through the course and graduate from the course it's kind of neat because they get a family uh, an annual family pass to the zoo and they get some other perks you know and things that they can that are family oriented that they can use to to bring their families so i've been working on my talk here the last uh, couple of weeks for for uh, uh, the um, group said fast fathers next week so again 
you know, a, as the pregnancy center has turned into a licensed medical clinic and as it has begun to add educational programs and parenting skills and cooking classes and all kinds of things to help, uh, this is one of the programs they started, and it is really blossoming into a wonderful, wonderful opportunity for a lot of uh, young guys. For somebody who has not recognized the, you know, the nudge, or uh, you know, how do you how do you recognize it uh, to where uh, the Lord is is nudging you, or is kind of you know. Um, I, suggesting some, some, that, that you get involved. Sometimes it's very, very subtle. You have to right. be. You have to. Be, and sometimes I'll hit you in the head. You know, it's just. Uh, you know, I've been hit in the head before. You know, um, I prayed that prayer one day. Lord, make me an instrument. Put somebody in front of me today that you can help through me. And Lord, be. I got. I. I I'm having such an awful day today. You know, if you're going to give me a nudge, you might have to hit me in the head. And I said that. I actually yeah. said that. I had a go, I had to go to a bank and uh, I had a, a little bill to pay and I had a little check that I was going to pay the bill and take the change and so forth. I went to a branch I normally don't go to uh, because it just happened to be on my way back from uh, from lunch and I went in and uh, I'm, you know as I'm transacting my business I couldn't help but notice there was a woman at the next teller window over she was trying to make a mortgage payment and she was three dollars and forty eight cents short. And I uh, conducted my thing in my business. I paid the bill. She gave me the change. I took the change in my hand. I put it in my pocket. Went out to the car, opened the door, and the sun visor fell down and hit me right in the head. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) So you walked back into the bank, didn't you? The sun visor had never done that before, and it hasn't done it since. Uh, My sun visor just doesn't do that, but it did it that day. The sun visor knocked me right in the head. I reached in my pocket and pulled out my change. It was $3.48. Stop it. I went back into the bank and gave it to the girl. She was able able to finish paying off her mortgage she gave me a hug the teller gave me a hug and a, and a, either a sucker or a balloon i can't remember but i got something from the teller uh and i left I put, put the visor back up and left and went back to work with a knot on my head and i said well you know i asked for it but you delivered That's what and you so sometimes yeah, yeah so sometimes the nudges are, are are not so subtle sometimes the nudges come you know you know we're sometimes we're in a in a situation joe where uh, you know, I, I, there's a group of people, and there's one person kind of not engaged, uh, and, and and oftentimes you know, I wonder what's going on there, and we just don't do anything about it. And what what we're asked to do is just go do something, go over to the person, hey, you okay, you know, and they might they may just blow you off, yeah, fine, you know, whatever, but you know, you you acted on that. Uh, I remember uh, learning. Uh, I was. Um, walking through uh, Bueller's one day and a guy came up to me that I knew from years ago when I was uh, coaching soccer and he began to tell me that he was uh, you know he was undergoing uh, chemotherapy and so forth uh, they had a, a cancer and I, I told him that I was a, a cancer survivor myself and and he asked me to pray for him and I said I would and you know I have a little book that I write names down and and, and I, I do pray for people and and he looked at me and he said would you pray for me now and so we right in the middle of Bueller's I uh, laid hands on him and prayed for him right there on the spot uh, at Bueller's and since that time when someone asked me to pray for him I pray for him right then I, I don't wait till later that night or whatever it's a it's a subtle change but when people ask you to pray for him they really want you to and the best way to do it is do it right then and there so these are the, the subtle bumps the little nudges you get that 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 once you do, um, there was a it was a promotion director up in Cleveland, uh, and she um, was a two time, three time cancer survivor, and she used to do a thing called the three o'clock call. Every day at three o'clock, she would drop whatever she was doing and call somebody. And generally speaking, the person would answer the phone and say, "Oh, I'm so glad you called. I was just thinking about you." You see, we're often nudged to call people, and when they answer the phone, they go, wow, you know, it's, it, I was just thinking about you. And I asked her, I said, do you ever run out of people to call? And she says, never. There's always somebody that can use your help, somebody that's had surgery, somebody that's gone through a divorce, somebody that's, you know, uh, having trouble with their kids. Or, uh, there's always somebody that you can call. And sometimes these calls last two minutes, and sometimes these calls go on for 45 minutes. It just depends. <clears throat> and I took that, and I said, I'm going to try that. And I haven't been as consistent as she is because she does it every day, but I tried it, and you know it really does work. You know, there's always somebody in your mind, somebody you're mm-hmm. you're thinking about, somebody that, you know, is going through a tough time. You go, well, I wonder how they're doing. Well, quit wondering. 
call them. The, the, the cop-out is, well, they really don't want to talk to anybody. They don't want to talk to me. Well, you know, that, that's not what they want. Well, that's not necessarily true. And so um, you learn that lesson. You know, you get a little lesson that comes uh, with that. Uh, I wrote a story called A Lesson and a Cure, and it, it, it's a totally different subject. But whenever the Lord nudges me and I act and I see the results of the act, he also gives me a, le- a, a lesson. I learn a lesson from that. And sometimes if you carry that lesson forward, it helps you to, um, uh, to, to be able to react to those nudges and bumps and God appointments and things that, that happen. Uh, well, you, you know, you, talk, you talked about the phone call or whatever, Tina. I think we had mentioned, and it's been a little while ago. Remember, it, it, was, a, it was a TV commer- or an ad or something about, but when someone's going to work and the little thought cl- or the little things are by everybody where this person just, uh, th- this person's, uh, you know, as you're driving down the street and somebody may have cut you off or whatever or just mm-hmm. turned in no front sure. of you. You, and you'll see the little thought cloud, you know, uh, just found out that mom had cancer sure. or this or that. And sure. and as this person gets to work, they realize that all the issues it's, you know, that, that other people are dealing with. It's just it's just sort of a reality check of and again, boom, boom, boom. There's all those people that, that as you mentioned, that could use your phone calls. And mm-hmm. uh, it, it was it was a real interesting. Uh, sure. uh, uh, it, it was an interesting commercial. I don't even remember what it was, but it was. It, yeah. It, yes, I, I, I do remember that. I, I love when you get a perspective change and something mm-hmm. shifts you. I read something this morning, it kind of ties into that, that says self-righteousness is a tremendous threat to self-respect. It will cause you to find fault with everyone and the world will go dark. That's a Brene Brown quote mm-hmm. from one of her books. Um, I can't think of what it's, the mm-hmm. book is called, but I think there's just something to be said with showing grace and mercy in life. I, I know I'm guilty of being distracted for various mm. legit reasons and uh, one of the things that I briefly got to look at through through your book was talking about how you know we talk about God appointments and we talk about ministering um, you know turning your misery into ministry and just ministering in general and the page that I happened to turn to was great because it was page 42 and it was talking about how you minister by the way you treat the various people in your life oh, yeah. too you know yeah. like my kids are turning to me and to my husband to see well how, how do we do this thing called life what is faith mm-hmm. you know how do you treat one another what am I mm-hmm. going to look for one day when I get married and I think that's so important um, we've been talking a lot about that it our church as well and how you conduct yourself says a lot about who you really are i have a a friend over in in, uh, england who was in uh, full-time ministry and uh, just couldn't make it financially and 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 had to leave full-time ministry and and you know get a a normal uh, secular job and it was really bothering him that he had to leave full-time ministry and i remember him uh, we had a a a telephone conversation uh, and and he said that he was, you know, it really hurt him that he was no longer in ministry. And I said, well, wait a minute, you are in ministry. You know, you, win, you minister by the way you treat your wife. And your kids see that. And you minister by the way you treat your friends. And, and, and you minister by the things that you do on a daily basis. That's all ministry. Uh, we, we sometimes want to, you know, we want to make it into something bigger than it is. We all minister on a daily basis as to how we treat people and how we uh, access people. Uh, uh, Father Greg Boyle out in Los Angeles uh, runs an organization called Homeboy Industries, which is the largest uh, gang intervention program in the world. And uh, he has a line that I, uh, that I use occasionally, and he says, uh, I am oftentimes in awe of what people have to go through. I can't judge how they've chosen to go through it. So I can't be judgmental. I'm in awe at the jail of some of the things that some of these uh, people in the jail have had to go through with with, with, uh, a bad back or something and started on Oxycontin and when it came off ended up taking heroin and so forth. And I can't judge how they've gone through that because I don't know how I would have done it had I been in that similar situation. That's the grace you talk about, Tina, when we talk about that, that I can't judge. You know, the guy that cuts me off on the road might, might have just got a diagnosis that, uh, you know, that, uh, that he's uh, terminally ill. I don't know that. I'm in awe of that. I can't be judgmental as to what's happened as he's gone through that. And, yeah, he happened to cut me off, and I honked the horn and, and so forth. 
But that's uh, what we have to learn a little bit more. Uh, and, and I think the world, that quote that you just read there, the world's a better place if we can get out of this uh, a, a judgmental attitude that a lot of people have. We, 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 because what you do is you find fault with everything and everyone, and, and that, that's not a way to live your life. Um, it really isn't. And uh, we, we, uh, we really need to be open to that, uh, to the graces that come from that. I, can I mention a couple other? I'm going to be speaking at the Wadsworth Women's Club today. And I love that. Yeah, that's cool, yeah. <laughs> Over at uh, Grace, uh, right here on the... Uh, Grace Lutheran Church. Grace uh, yeah. Lutheran, right here near... Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Cross Street, right Street City, City Hall. Hall. Right right across from City Hall, beautiful church with yeah. the steep, with the two spires mm-hmm. at the top. Mm-hmm. I haven't been in that church in a long time. and Gorgeous. And so I'm going to be uh, there today. Uh, the uh, My talk is at 1.30, but, but they have... Dessert and coffee at twelve thirty. So oh. I think I'm going. To, <laughs> I, 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 I kind of got that kind of got that apple pie thing going from the Ritman Orchard down there. So I got to maybe stop in there. But I'll be there, and I'll be back at the library. Uh, yeah, that's a good. Uh, uh, Donald Harmon, uh, who invited me in June to uh, come out and talk about the first book of the library. We had a big, big crowd of people. It was a wonderful night, and 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 the stories were just fantastic. It, uh, I told stories. I heard stories. You know, we talked, and I signed a lot of books that night. He He's inviting me to come back, and it will be there on October seventeenth. Seventeenth, uh, seven p.m. It's a great day because that's my o'clock. birthday. Oh, October seventeenth. Oh, I know where Tina's <laughs> going to be. <laughs> She'll be home with the with the cake and ice cream. No, I, I think uh, Tina's going to get nudged. I, I uh, <laughs> so I'm I'm looking forward to, to speaking at the, at the library What's again. Uh, what's it like when you know we we had heard from Daniel's life about the crowd that you had at the, at the library? What's it like? I mean. You've lived here for 40 years. I mm-hmm. mean, and I'm sure you either had in touch with a lot of folks who came that night that you either knew or maybe were, you know, were nudged. And what, what's that like? It, to, it's it's wonderful. I mean, uh, 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 we had uh, uh, a woman and her husband and son. They were neighbors of ours years ago here in town when we first moved here. And the son was just a kid, and, and now he's a, a grown adult and a great guy. And, and he and I become, you know, adult friends. Uh, uh, and, and uh, you know, there are a couple of guys from the Methodist prayer group that, I you know, we played golf with. Uh, we, we always play in the uh, in the uh, Marion's Closet uh, fundraising oh. uh, golf tournament. And uh, I should say, and don't take this as a brag, but we did win two years in a row. Oh. And uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, one, of, one of my buddies put a thing out that said, we're the reigning champs, R-A-I-N, rain, <laughs> reigning champs. <laughs> And this year, for some reason, I uh, I tweaked my back right the week before we were supposed to play in it. So I did not play in it, and I got a sub, and they finished second. Mm. So, um, But anyhow, the guys from the Methodist Church, they always rib me that we should not show up so that they can win, because I think they've come in second mm-hmm. two or three times. But yeah, I, I saw a lot of uh, They brought their whole men's group there uh, that night, and... There were some people from the, my writers group here in town that came out. Uh, just wonderful support for each other, you know, the writers supporting writers, and uh, and some friends. And it was just a, a really a, a neat uh, a neat group of people, and a lot of people I had never met before. You know, it's yeah. funny. I, I I've been speaking a lot since uh, since the first book came out, and I've had crowds of. Uh, you know, um, five thousand women at the Columbus uh, uh, Women's Conference, d- down to like four people that showed up at a at a place in Canton, and it, actually the one with the four people ended up being a wonderful night because they they began sharing, and we had a lot more more one on one. I've spoken up at the senior center. We had a lot of seniors come out, and they were just fantastic. I say a bunch of the seniors. I qualify <laughs> yeah. myself. Uh, so uh, yeah, a bunch of my my uh, Peer. my peers uh, uh, came out for them. Had a wonderful talk. I was invited by a buddy of mine, Dan Sondles, to speak at First Christian right over right over here, almost across from uh, mm-hmm. from Grace uh, mm-hmm. Evangelical Lutheran, and and I spoke for one of their Sunday school classes. So they had their morning service and their their late morning service, and I had the the middle and it was a great group we had a wonderful time there i really enjoy speaking at yeah you know, speaking at churches and i enjoy speaking for different organizations like embrace um it, it just puts you in front of people who who are, are already doing some of these services and ministries and they're involved and so it's wonderful that i spoke over at saint hillary's to their charismatic prayer group uh two weeks ago and what a wonderful group of people uh and uh, we had a, j- just had a, a super time and it was nice to just get away and relax and 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 
sing some praise songs and so forth before before my talk. I'm speaking to Life Teen. Uh, it's a it's a national group. The Life Teen group is at Holy Martyrs up in Medina, and I'll be I'll be speaking there in a, in a couple of weeks. So there's a lot of these you know th- uh, things that you know that come up that I and, and you know a lot of out of town things. Those are some of the local things. But you know if there's any uh, churches uh, in the area that are looking for a speaker and and so forth, uh, I'm uh, I'm more than happy to go out and and uh, and share some stories. Um, as I said, the book sales, uh, you know, and we'll, we'll have the book for sale at the Women's Club today. All the book sales, all the 100% of the proceeds will go to uh, to the charities and ministries that I support. And you can get the book where? Both the old, uh, 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 the, the first one and the them. second one. Yeah, they're both, they're both available uh, online at Amazon.com uh, or at BarnesandNoble.com or at Books a Million or any of the other, any of the other book, uh, online book uh, uh, stores um, is, is where, where you can get them. I will uh, give you a special offer here if you want to go to my website, TonyAgnesi.com. And you go to the store on my website, and uh, in the coupon code, type in FRIENDS, F-R-I-E-N-D-S. Uh, it'll take 10% off the cost of the book, and we'll ship them for free, and I'll autograph every one. So that's uh, just, wow, just, wow. Just, for wow. Yun's, just for Yun's guys just today. Just for Yun's guys. And so, uh, yeah, we'll do, we'll, we'll do a little discount and, and uh, ship and, uh, and sign them.